Hello all, and moving right into more plateaus and a thousand plateaus with the losing Guitari. Last time we left with the War Machine in part, so now we are going to start the plateau on becoming animal and becoming intense. And so really, um, we're seeing the workings out of this experimentation of the body without organs or these you know, characteristics of the animals and its aversion of classifications. And so this is really expressed with the term involution, which is what they use as the embodiment of this creative process of uh, linking uh, heterogeneous terms as a means of a, of a block of becoming, if you will. And so this is, you know, tracing lines of flight that really escapes classification, of course, because um, we are, you know, in the act of becoming. And so this process averts the molar interpretations um, as becoming contradicts classification, of course, with human thought expanding. Um, and so becoming uh, ultimately escapes representation. And so there's three different distinctions of how they see uh, the animal, if you will. There's the sentimental and history infused, a sort of narcissistic one, as they would point out, which uh, you know infuses really the human character, such as my dog, my cat. There's a sort of possessiveness here. And the second case is really a, a sort of um, molar coding of averages of you know, the classifications of uh, an animal, um, you know, for scientific purposes, of course, and Aristotelian biology, uh, you know, with their genius or um, a sort of characteristic. And so the, there's also the state animal uh, to part with, with uh, its definitions and meanings really coming from myth as seen with, um, you know, the, shaman, uh, the shamanic representation uh, and the relational tree is a sort of hierarchy of being that we talked about earlier. Or even someone like Carl Jung with their archetypes uh, using uh, these animalistic uh, uh, symbols. But of course, third is the animal organization, um, such as the pack or in their analysis of rats which of course could extend to something like the Wolfman uh, Plateau with, you know, wolves. And so really they're discussing these methodology, really, or memories as they'd call it, um, and then uh, proceed to not call it. It's kind of uh, weird, but um, uh, certainly within literature you can see these examples with uh, Captain Ahab who, you know, wants to really become the whale or, um, you know, the masochist or how, you know, little Hans, uh, you know, in his understandings are, you know, conformed into the Freudian uh, aggregates. And so, you know, there's an ongoing transformation into, you know, more multiplicities ultimately. So the pack really shifts from the wolves to the example of the swarm of, of you know, bees or insects or really along the lines that, you know, go into the analysis of the contagion that they talked about earlier. And so multiplicities have to, of course, have some sort of, you know, bordered lines uh, that really acts as a sort of threshold of these intensities, uh, such as the position of the fixated self is, you know, a threshold or a door to another creation of a multiplicity, which is really how they kind of see the self. And so you're really stringing from, you know, within, you know, the sort of self-organization that they really uh, hearken on. And so with the process of in, uh, elongating, you know, such as from inside and in the string of, of borderlines of, uh, you know, these fibers, which ultimately change, you know, the dimensions and properties of the multiplicities. And so a fiber can stretch, of course, from human life to animal life as the example of um, you know, viruses or diseases. Um, but really that's, uh, you know, from uh, the molecules uh, to then particles, uh, which is ultimately, you know, guided or directed in a way into uh, 
being imperceptible. And so a fiber strung across constitutes as, you know, really flight paths or deterritorializations. So the outsider or uh, anomalous, you know, functions as a sort of border that determines how multiplicities will stabilize, uh, how they will be in the uh, temporality process, or, um, you know, the, their determined dimensions uh, in any given circumstance. So again, this is just going into how uh, you know, there's a sort of morphology from within, within their own, uh, you know, bordering scheme here. But ultimately becoming for Deleuze and Guattari, as they put, is, is not an imitation, but it's actually a sort of confrontation to this block of becoming. And so this is demonstrated in what they'll get into with the examples of uh, proximal principles and um, desired processes. And so becoming is to take on certain uh, particulars in relations to how they rest and take motion based on its uh, proximities or zoning. Uh, and so in the emission of, of particles that enter that zone, uh, they take on to those uh, relations. And so in the example, moving on then to how, you know, music is introduced for how it escapes uh, really form. Um, and so it's escaping form and systemization in order to really experiment um, you know, imitation is an adjustment of the becoming block in its purest uh, incarnation, really, or, or purest effects, I think, is the, is the better way of looking at it. And so being imperceptible is where all becomings go to the end uh, or an imperceptible imminence. One tries to be like everyone else in a metaphoric, uh, you know, fashion. But it is, uh, it is ultimately in the realm of becoming, as not everyone does become everyone, then this makes everyone it is the molar aggregate, but becoming everybody is an affair of the cosmos and, uh, you know, this molecular, you know, process or, you know, chaos really, uh, is a worldly creation within the worlds. And so by conjugations and overlaying onto the world and ultimately tracing the lines of becoming, uh, this is really them, you know, getting at uh, evolutionary presuppositions, I think you would uh, see here. But then this is, of course, moving to the concept of, of refrains. And so refrains really act as a, as a preservation of order, uh, much like faciality and uh, the demonstration of, you know, sign regimes, you know, being pushed through, um, you know, the common, you know, uh, friendly real face of, of that civilization or society um, you know as a way of, of coding uh, on the um, symbolism um, but here we're really talking actually more about um, you know, natural uh, constructions here as opposed to these you know social formations and so chaos really faces the refrains of the earth by this process of uh, milieus which make up uh, by, um, you know, the internal, external, and the intra, uh, to go back to logic of sense, really, and that systemization there. So this ultimately becomes territories and really, you know, the passage of, of flows into intensities felt through rhythm. Um, and so by the way the mill use, uh, you know, order the refrains, uh, then they are made by transcoding and settling onto territories, thus offering up to decode them. And so this is not really a matter of evolution, but far more into a complex relational scheme between these milieus, uh, used by refraining into what we would call territory uh, components. And so the territory components act really as this you know, boundary, uh, since the landscape for Deleuze and Guattari is, of course, a deterritorialization itself, as the example of the civilizational step, you know, off the desert, um, and so you know we're in this deterritorialized landscape, and so this is why they would say or suggest against you know the worshiping of the symbols of the earth, or um, you know these uh, milieu differences uh, in territory because it's a production of, of deterritorialization by power and uh, really 
into the machines of, of production. But um, moving along then to what they call uh, individuals. And so this is an interesting term uh, and really uh, I think is more appropriate for societies of control when he collaborates with or Deleuze collaborates with uh, Foucault because really this is a term to you know describe the statistical unit or, or the sort of abstraction um, and so um, you know this is really a, a reduction uh, to the uh, compartment um, singularity but just to demonstrate again with the refrains so the milieu refrain splits into parts that ultimately self-reference uh, whereas these natal refrains are, you know, parts are related to the holistic territory or whole earth. And so sometimes these, of course, are made more specific, as is the song of the bird or uh, special refrains of the lullaby in their musical example. And so folk and popular refrains uh, really are, are differences of crowds and groups or, or nations and of course the molecularized uh, refrains are tied to those cosmic forces uh, which really they iterate with the sea and the wind. And so the refrain in, in sound is ambiguous and deterritorialized for a cosmic opening and the refrain acts as a sort of prism, a crystallized space uh, and, and time which interacts its surroundings acting upon uh, even offering an indirect interaction between these elements. Uh, it is a structure that augments and adds or diminishes, uh, it can add or withdraw. And so sounds or uh, with the musician, uh, they're taking prior forms and harnessing them for new potentials and interactions from those conventional forms through experimentation. Um, and so how we see with the war machine, um, this is really when you get to these different sets of binaries and analogies that kind of interwoven in a sort of rhizomatic way uh, that kind of reference each other to you know, the smooth and the striated, the war machine and the, the apparatus of capture. Um, and so you have these different binaries, as I've mentioned, to smooth and striated spaces, um, which is you know really tied, of course, to the intensive and the extensive, I would also say, in Deleuze's past works. Um, and you also have the binary of the, you know, the nomadic traveling um, and um, the settled uh, singular uh, as well uh, as the category, the sort of event that, you know, reifies all of the categories back into uh, their forms or as we'll get into their sciences. And then, of course, there's the nomos and logos distinction. But just to see in their far less abstract accounts, we should look at these you know, different games that they put forth with chess and go. This is, of course, an example, really, of the striated versus the smooth in, in gamesmanship. Uh, the state acts as a sort of two-headed uh, vessel, a, a pair of uh, domination between the war machine or magician king uh, against the, uh, the coding and the interpretive uh, priest. And so again, you're seeing all these binaries set up here and how you know, there's no real, uh, which of course they would say with regards to Hegel, there's no you know, dialectic. These are all uh, you know, interwoven it, uh, into each other. There's no you know, set fixed representation to really have a sort of uh, Hegelian dialectic, if you will. Uh, that's another thing that I think you might want to uh, look at and how they see Hegel and see their relation uh, to the German uh, you know, thinkers, I think, uh, overall. And so uh, affects uh, act really as the harnessed weapons of war, really as the various becomings, which kind of ties into what they'll have to say with the minoritarian compared to the majority. But then this begins our discussion really on royal science and nomadic science. And so this is the difference in a discussion between the coding of material and generalizations compared to singularity, singularities or the nomadic ruptures. Uh, 
uh, that ultimately reconfigure the state. And these are the two models of uh, science that Plato actually discussed uh, between compars and dispars. One is of discovery of these laws uh, and forms. The other is the effects or effectuates uh, on their concept of matter again that we discussed earlier. Uh, the actual forces really that you know, make up matter or the laws for matter, uh, you could say. And so dispars is one of supplementary differences from the royal sciences or disciplines uh, that cannot be reduced as a force to the system at hand. Just as the case with chemistry, uh, chemistry adds on to the forces of, of gravity where gravity act as the model, uh, really universal application of course, with you know the likes of foundationalism, certainly in the Enlightenment, one would say, um, and so you had this prior model through that applicative, uh, you know, aspect of gravity. Uh, it really acted as an its sort of interior to the royal sciences for you know formalizing these principles. It was a presupposition, really, that you know gave order. And so, sounds or colors cannot be gridded. Uh, uh, onto these externals of, of royal sciences, of course, that is until, um, you know, digital art now, uh, which is kind of interesting to see how, you know, even when you make uh, these sort of assertions, nonetheless, uh, you know, uh, there's a sort of deterritorialization that would make that actually possible now. And so royal science is the study of the differences among aggregates and reinforces uh, those suppositions. Uh, normal thought then is not just in content but uh, conformist really in nature to base itself on you know these models of the state that re uh, relates to of course the dogmatic images or scientific pictures convention is a synthesis between true thinking of magic capture and these foundationalist principles and so again they're pointing at these you know processes within these binaries here that uh, really make up our world as we see it. And so the nomads in the spaces operate with no uh, destination in mind, but to ultimately deterritorialize land. The smooth space lies between the striated spaces of the state, but the smooth is necessary for the state to communicate uh, these captures of flows uh, of exteriors, giving us ultimately these fixed paths or normative uh, thinking, as they suggested, and so speed must be turned to movement and movement endlessly transformed to regulate speed. When the war machine arrives, a smooth space develops from uncaptured flows or a minoritarian, um, usually a, a sort of nomadic people turning into uh, you know, the exterior state apparatus where the war machine is positioned at. And then this, of course, can tie into how you know, numbering and the nomadics uh, and its revelation to you know how intelligence works within the state and so numbering really gains mastery over matter to control its variations and movements such as the case of commerce uh, taxing or the dividing of numbers into smaller uh, armies and increments and so the state is uh, one of large quantities while the nomads are the smaller deterritorialized parts uh, based on the distribution in space rather than uh, divisibility. And so space itself numbers suggest directions and leads to strategies such as ambush or retreat. Uh, numbers can be used by the war machine in its lineage selection uh, towards the state. And so the war machine liberates free action and is an assemblage of uh, formal weaponry and adds different notions of speed to this free action. And so now we're going to dig into the five differences in assemblages or uh, compositions of desire. Uh, music and drugs uh, is similar to the war machine and, and the nomad, whereas you know cooking and architecture uh, is re uh, really resonates, if you will, to the state apparatus, to those formalized principles, to the difference between chess and go. And so you can see how you know, these all kind of interwove into each other as well with their thinking that I think is very interesting here. But uh, moving to these classifications of these assemblages, 
you have the one of direction, uh, which is a sort of projectile or an inwardness. Uh, the second being a vector, which uh, is related to speed or gravity. Third is the model free action or work. Four, the jewelry or written signs. And then five, you have the passional uh, effects. And so moving through these distinctions here, uh, technologies then are made uniform by the state, but of course they can override paradigms and help reinvent war machines, as is the case with their theory of revolutions or, or, or you know, populist uprisings and, and wars. Um, and so there's the critiques of, of form models that do not account for, uh, and so looking at Husserl's vague essences, which aren't formal or these you know, fuzzy aggregates, that are corporeal rather than the thing's uh, essence. And so this is below the changing of bodies or transformations. Form models require ignoring activity or effects in order to make laws. So yeah, they have to sort of act as this sort of ignorance uh, towards this uh, activity here in order to make their, um, you know, um, look at sort of these essences, as is the case with the uh, Husserl. And so there's this energetic materiality that's necessary to rupture and create forms out of our singularities. And so the nomad is concerned with moving into the smooth in that creative capacity through the lines of flight that the state appropriates and has historically used in the acts of total war. And so the war machine is to occupy the smooth space as it's sort of uh, telos almost. And so not just objects of war, um, as it might suggest in the name, um, um, but ultimately they're comprised uh, as a sort of exterior of the apparatus at hand. And so this moves to the discussion of uh, state formation in totality uh, through capitalism by machinic assemblage. And so this again is the shift from it's not actual production uh, the mechanisms of uh, primitive society prevented that centralization uh, through the acts of, of refrains, uh, through those boundary acts of lineage and blood, as discussed uh, in earlier plateaus. And so the apparatus of capture uh, has uh, three formats in the acts of, of rent, profit, and tax, which have converged to overcode and create the black hole white wall image uh, earlier in uh, the different relations. And so to continue, captures are distinctions of the evolved uh, state, which ultimately resonates with exteriors. Uh, and so the war machine uh, between the magic and, and, and contract, uh, you know, is, is a sort of, uh, you know, multiplicity really in a way uh, that links them um, through myth and the state has the milieu of the interiority or unity of uh, composition which all states share in their stage of development called capture which are self-evident or without any distinct causes so again you're seeing how you know in the coding there there's a sort of self-evidence or self-referentialness um, that um, ultimately can't be uh, undermined, otherwise they can't be uh, these you know, sort of formalized uh, captures. And so to reiterate with their arguments here, the city and the state distinction uh, is one of melody and one of harmony. Both ultimately are necessary for the striated space. And so moving then to the axiomatic, uh, the axiomatic uh, acting as a sort of conjunction of decoded flows or uh, the capitalist mode of production where unquestioned rules or, or unity uh, composites such as the shape of the ball uh, in the game or the offside rule in soccer is really applied here to capital subordinating on a global basis for nations to subvert their own interests towards uh, one of profit uh, so again, you can kind of see how they're questioning, uh, you know, in this globalized capitalistic uh, axiomatic system, you know, how nation states have uh, autonomy uh, outside of profit. And I think this is a very interesting uh, observation here that could really be used as uh, some brushing up on, uh, uh, certainly in, in our spheres. And so...
uh, capitalism is, is a global axiom of subjectified, uncoded flows, hence our differences in subjectivity among nations. Uh, we are put to the media forms, such as how McLuhan in media studies would say about, uh, you know, the media is the message with uh, how technological frameworks such as, you know, television uh, reduces really to these uh, intrinsic components uh, that I think um, is really relevant here to what Deleuze and Guattari are saying. And so... Um, Exchanges of information or realization is then produced as a sort of new enslavement, really, under the machines. Um, politics, then, is uh, one of experimentation. Science, then, is post hoc finding epistemology, whereas politics uh, experiments with this, uh, you know, error factor, this sort of um, confrontation with the you know, the unexpected uh, or singularities that uh, can't be, you know, put into this systemization and we have to, you know, reevaluate the exteriors again. And so capital isn't fully fledged or theoretical, but operative statements such as consumption or production uh, and can withdraw or put forth new axioms into an assemblage. Capitalism really sets its own laws and limits such as profits falling, but constantly has to reevaluate it. And so capitalism then is axiomatically embedded by always, uh, but can always exceed it, such as the finance uh, industry or military complexes, and directs towards uh, you know, this capital development. The axiomatic develops out of the numbered thresholds driven by uh, its war machine. So again, you're seeing that you know, capital really acts as its own formalizing and own, uh, you know, destructive means of, of that formalization. Um, and so you have an unequal exchange in capitalistic, uh, you know, axiomatics, uh, require, uh, which require of a, of a center. Uh, so not only does it create, but forms its own crisis, such as uh, primitive flows overcoding and producing decoded flows at the same time markets create these class ruptures that require the state to intervene uh, new classes and tensions are produced even after uh, labor product theory and into ones such as intensive and surplus labor so they're building really on their um, you know, marxist background here to uh, something that they're seeing in their contemporary time and so minorities then are becomings resisting the axioms constituting the majority and are best seen as these non-denumerable uh, sets um, which are connected by the capitalist axioms such as the masses implying uh, multiplicities of escape and the flux in the minoritarian uh, aspect. And so minorities can uh, resurrect uh, nationalities uh, which resist control by becoming a part of the finite system or given a part of a, a complementary position. Minorities, uh, this expression is only by becoming pure becoming or a multiplicity and not from joining or integration uh, into these majority axioms. And so these are the effects of the non-denumerable to the axiomatic and on the highest scale the proletarian or uh, power or even particularity and so there's a lot to really unpack there uh, with how you know the sort of relationship works between um, you know the minority and uh, the majority and how we evaluate in, in those axioms and so to maybe really tie this together capitalism sets and overcomes its own limitations uh, and through crisis, uh, which is the production of flows that escape the very axiomatic to begin with. And so this produces the non-denumerable sets in the creation of these non-denumerable sets that disrupt. And so it amplifies all the coded differences or flows in a way that re-territorializes them as new land or compositional consistencies. And so this is a description of problems really at the virtual level here. Um, 
And so the undecidable propositions, uncertainty in uh, the result of change of lines of flight that connect and requires revolutionary decision making, um, or high technology and enslavement cannot you know, solve this on its own. And so struggle is a function of all these undecidable propositions which construct revolutionary connections that oppose conjugations of the axiomatic. So again, this is really their account for how um, you know, minoritarian groups are, are really formed out of the axiomatic and how you know, capitalism actually deterritorializes and you know, harnesses these, uh, you know, these differences or, or, or these ruptures here and um, you know, needs to create more crisis in order to sustain itself. And so the smooth space is continuous and uninterrupted, where the striated space has ordered lines, the grids, the chessboard, if you will, uh, the structure put forth onto it in the two examples. Uh, there's a dynamic in nature and a, and a sort of mixture. Um, so one requires the other in order to you know, do this process, really, of the smooth and striated. And so you could think of intensives, uh, really indifference and repetition, as the grounding for the extensive forces and uh, tractors that ultimately produce actualization in something like thermodynamics. Uh, the gases turning into liquids or solids as temperatures are adjusted, changing you know, the fundamentals uh, or the categories of that system itself uh, and its representation. Smooth space is nomadic space where the war machine develops and striated space is sedentary and occupied by the state apparatus. And so this difference is meant to mix and not you know, oppose, but requires this sort of distinction through abstraction in order for the mixtures to take place as the different arrangements below. And so then they have these different models here with the technological model uh, which is associated with the fabric striated by vertical and horizontal elements, one which is fixed and the other mobile. The felt fabric and woven fabric is really an example of patchwork uh, on quilts or the weaving of the external and the sedentary to make clothes. Uh, the smooth then uh, is not homogeneous, but a smooth aggregate. And so such is the case with the American quilt with its patchwork. You know, there's no entry or center point despite uh, you know, having a sort of repetition to their uh, elements and how they repeat. Um, and so uh, again with music then, um, in the simplest form, the smooth space is occupied without countering uh, offering uh, non-metric multiplicities in directional spaces frequencies or breaks between the regular and the undetermined are distributed by a modular principle to regulate the standard uh, and so it could be straight curved or or irregular the distribution has no break uh, although it might still be equal more or less rare or even dense and so the smooth can be seen as nomos and striated as uh, logos music can uh, paradoxically be created in texture without uh, anything fixed or, uh, or you know, this homogeneous values uh, where the bottom uh, striated or striation produce order and succession or uh, horizontal uh, melodonic uh, lines and uh, vertical harmonic planes. And so while the smooth offers a sort of continuous variation and continued forms in its fusion of harmony and melody, uh, acting as a sort of diagonal across the vertical and the horizontal. And then moving um, to the maritime model, which are lines or trajectories that are uh, subordinated to points, where in smooth space, the points are subordinates to the line's trajectory. And so the changes really, as they'll examine in the nomadic patterns, uh, habits are conceded to variability of the goal or point to be attained. Smooth space is filled by events or what they would call uh, these Hasidis, uh, 
uh, rather than well-formed and perceived things and features, effects, rather than properties. And so the striated has organized matter, but in the smooth materials, signal forces and serve as a sort of symptom uh, for them on as intensive, the other extensive, one of distance, one of measure, uh, or a body without organs instead of an organism, is one way of putting it. And so the par excellence then, the sea is the smooth space uh, which is striated by navigation, following the bearings and map such as voyaging before uh, something like longitude. Uh, and so you have these characteristics of the sea as these sort of um, divisibility, if you will, of the smooth space of the sea. And so the smooth characteristics in the neo-nomadic uh, uh, could be seen as the submarine uh, to harness the smooth uh, to the striated spaces completely through perpetual motion. And so the military-industrial complex then, uh, with the hyperscreen effects, uh, objects to uh, imitate real objects act as a sort of deterritorialization of the smooth. Uh, these are colonizations of the smooth and turned into eventually the uh, global organization itself um, in a sort of re-territorialization.